teaching. All right, well, this fall we are going through the book of Nehemiah, and I really just love this story. If if you've missed the past few weeks, uh, let me bring you up to speed real quick. In part one, in week one, we were introduced to Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the Persian king Artaxerxes. And a cupbearer was really somebody, a trusted uh, confidant next to the king who would drink the wine and eat the food to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. So it had to be a trusted individual. And Nehemiah hears about the distressed state of uh, of the land of his forefathers. Not just, obviously, he's been in exile. He's been out of the land uh, for a long time. But he hears of the the distress repair specifically of the walls of Jerusalem. And he is overcome with sadness. And he spends time in prayer and fasting, confessing the sins of Israel. And he even confesses his own sin, asking God for guidance and favor to help rebuild uh, the walls of Jerusalem. In week two, we, uh, we see Nehemiah makes a bold request to the king. And we're going to see him, him pray a bold prayer today in chapter 4. But he goes before the king and he asks for permission to go to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And the king grants his request, but he also provides with him letters of safe passage and resources for the journey, an army, a, a cavalry. Um, he, he provides for him uh, a letter for materials to, to, to rebuild this wall. And so Nehemiah sets out for Jerusalem with all this coverage, the king's coverage uh, in all of these ways, this king's protection. And then last week we looked uh, as the reconstruction began. Uh, Upon arriving in Jerusalem, Nehemiah inspects the damage of the walls and the gates, and then he gathers the people of of Jerusalem and inspires them to begin this construction project or this reconstruction project that God has called them uh, to to, to build. And, And, you know, if you were here last week, you heard me fumble through countless Hebrew names detailing uh, really the various groups and individuals who took part on, on on different sections of rebuilding different sections of the walls and the gates. And they were working together to rebuild the city's defenses. People came from far and wide to join in the effort. And so today, as we rejoin the story, about halfway through this rebuilding effort, um, you might remember back in, in chapter two, we were introduced to the, uh, for the first time to some folks that we're going to hear about uh, in the next couple weeks who, who have been in that region for a long period of time. They, they, they heard about these rebuilding efforts and they were annoyed. They were none too happy about it. Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite and also um, Geshem the Arab. And, And you see, these guys were governors. They were officials in the neighboring areas and they were upset because they, they were upset because ultimately their financial situation was threatened by the rebuilding of these walls. They wanted things to stay the way that they were. They didn't want anybody upsetting their financial situation. There's a number of reasons why they were upset about this rebuilding effort. And they were the power players. And here this new kid on the block, Nehemiah, comes from a foreign land and starts, uh, and he's able to garner this great following of people to rebuild uh, the effort, uh, the ball, uh, to the walls, sorry. And, ramp, and so what happens, what we notice in, in chapter 4 is that when the rebuilding really ramps up, that's the moment when the opposition also ramps up. And so the question as we move into this chapter, the question for the break is, what do you do when you face opposition? What do you do when you face opposition? When opposition not just comes at you, but it starts to increase. When the voices that are opposing you are getting louder and louder, how do you react? 
How do you handle that? Well, Nehemiah gives us a few uh, examples of what to do when opposition rises. Now, as, as we jump in, let me say that it's no coincidence that once the work has started and there's a, a, a certain amount of success, that is the point that the opposition intensifies. They wouldn't have any, these folks wouldn't have anything to say if Nehemiah didn't have any success in gathering a group of people to rebuild these walls. If they were rebuilding and the walls were falling down, they wouldn't have anything to say. They would say, look, they're just, it's just a waste of time. But here Nehemiah is having some success. And he has unity and support amongst the people, and they are getting this job done. Now, I, I went back and forth, but I feel like we got to read through the whole chapter, and then we're going to unpack it um, as we, after we go through it. So, Nehemiah chapter 4, starting in verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, watch this, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Now watch this. This is like your schoolyard taunt. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it could take down their wall of stones. It's kind of like Jets fans before the beginning of the season. They said, ha, 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 we have a quarterback, and that all fell apart in the first three plays. Life is hard as a Jets fan. <laughs> Hear us, O oh God. Watch what Nehemiah does. Hear us, O oh God. We are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites, by the way, that's north, south, east, and west. The, 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 the opposition is coming from all four sides of Jerusalem. Those people are from all four sides. So they're surrounded by opposition. Uh, heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone, had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard and, and night to meet uh, this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put on an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. We'll fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When your enemies heard that they were aware, when our enemies heard that they were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half equipped with spears, shields, bows and armor. The officers post them, posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. When I said to the nobles, now watch this, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. 
Amen. Would you pray with me for a moment? Father, thank you for this story. Thank you for your defense. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for the confidence that we all can have in you, in your presence, in your word. And so, God, would you speak through me now in Jesus' name? Amen. So far with Nehemiah, it's been a smooth ride. You know, for the rest of, for Nehemiah and the rest of the Jewish people, he got everything that he needed, as I said, from the Persian king who, who granted him uh, leave, who gave him protection, and who helped him secure those supplies. And now Nehemiah has this huge workforce of people committed to this holy work. And, and there seems to be a sense, or this sense, that they are all a part of something really big that God has called them to. The stones are being laid uh, uh, in place after months of spiritual and political and logistical preparation. And now that the actual work begins, this is the moment, as I said already, that the opposition really starts to ramp up. And this reveals to us a very important reality, not just for Nehemiah and the people of God those 2,500 years ago, but for you and I as well. And that is this, is that when we are building or rebuilding in this case, what God has called us to build, opposition is guaranteed. When we are building what God has called us to build, opposition is guaranteed. And some of you are saying right now, you know, when I accepted Jesus Christ, I, I thought everything would be like roses. Everything is going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. And, and, and I got some news for you today. When you accept Christ, that's when the opposition ramps up. Because we're on the right side of, of the whole spiritual uh, warfare thing. And, and, and that's when the opposition rises up. But don't lose heart. Take heart. Because God is with you. When we build, we will face opposition. Opposition is a sure thing when we're doing the right thing. And you know, if that's actually true, which I guarantee you it is. You don't have to take my word for it. But I believe it to be true. Certainly in my own life it has been true. And I think the scripture bears that out. When we face opposition, we should actually be encouraged. I know that sounds strange, but if we're doing what God has called us to do, if we're building what God has called us to build, then we should expect opposition. We should be encouraged by that in a sense when we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. You know, for instance, you decide to follow Jesus and suddenly you find that there's intense opposition. Anybody in here come to Christ out of, out of a Jewish tradition or a Buddhist tradition or, or, or a different tradition and, and one you realize is all of a sudden you've said yes to Jesus Christ and all of your family says no to you. I've met so many people who have given their life over to Christ only to find that their friends and their family are now in opposition to them. Make no mistake that when you and I decide to follow Jesus and walk the path of discipleship and stand on the foundation of the good news of the gospel, that is when opposition will start to make its voice heard. And this is true not just in, in, in that sphere, but in every sphere of our lives. Friends, when we are walking in discipleship, we are building with God a life that is used for his glory. And that, friends, meets opposition. Or how about this? You put up a boundary when somebody repeatedly hurts you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? A spouse or a sibling or a friend or a mother or a father. You set up that boundary and now all of a sudden it seems to get worse rather than get better. How dare you stand up for yourself? How dare you restore your self-dignity is what comes at you. Or you decide to break away from unhealthy sin patterns or family patterns and you get an earful from your family instead of encouragement. So I'll say it again. When you are building what God has called you to build, opposition is guaranteed. It's a sure thing. 
And if you and I don't move forward through our lives with this reality in mind, then what happens is it can short circuit our growth process. We can quit the work along the way because we thought that things were going to get better when we set out to rebuild our lives or whatever it is we're building only to find out that we are agitated in our efforts and others around us are agitated in our efforts. And we get discouraged. This is, this is why Jesus tells the parable of the seed falling in the different areas along the hard-worn path or against the thorn bushes. When this oppression comes up, when this opposition comes up, sometimes we give up. I need you to know that opposition is a sure thing, but it doesn't mean your defeat. If God has called you to build, which he's called every one of us to build, don't be discouraged by the opposition. And this is what Nehemiah shows us here in this place is that, you know what he does? And and it's in my notes, but I'm just preaching here. He ignores the opposition. They complain and, and and they make fun of and they make this statement about the fox knocking down the wall. And Nehemiah doesn't even give ear to it. The opposition comes, the accusation comes, and he doesn't even recognize it. Friends, how many of you, myself included, when the opposition comes, when the enemy of my soul is speaking into my ear all sorts of lies and making fun of me, how often do I give voice to that and ear to that? What I want to tell you this morning is that when the enemy of your soul or the enemy that the, that the enemy of the soul uses against you, when, when, you're, when lies are being spoken against you, ignore it. Just walk away. This is what Jesus is, is, is teaching us when he says, turn the other cheek. Just don't even give voice to it. Don't, just tune that out. Tune it out. What Nehemiah does and and really what he shows us in his leadership is that he continues to trust in God's promises. He continues to, to, to remember that God has ordained this work, that he's called not only Nehemiah, but the people to this work, and God will be faithful to secure whatever is necessary for them to accomplish this work. And so really, Nehemiah shows us four things, or, or Nehemiah and the folks uh, and the people, uh, that they continue the work, they pray, they mind the gap, and I'll explain that in a moment, and then they, they stick together. Now, I've already pointed this out, that, that they keep on working. They don't stop to say, well, what was that you said? They don't do a, They don't have a counter, uh, uh, you know, a counter word when, when they say, "Well, you know, if your fox it wasn't so, you know, lame, it wouldn't be able to lock down my wall." There's no counter uh, attack. There's no. There's no banter that goes backwards there or back back to them. They just. They just keep on working. Doesn't give them any more time uh, and, or press uh, for the, this opposition. Friends, if you want to frustrate the opposition, don't get down in the mud with them. I don't know who said this, but I've heard this statement before. Never wrestle with a pig because both of you get dirty and the pig likes it. Right? Just don't play that game. Don't get in the mud. Let me give you a quick example. This has been bothering me over the past couple weeks. We, obviously, we've been announcing Rise Against Hunger and as we do from time to time, we put up a, a social media post. We create a, a post about what we're doing so that people in the neighborhood and our community know that we're doing this thing and, and we have a link and all that. And, and, and what I do from time to time is I'll put some dollars behind that post so that it kind of gets out there. Facebook, I know, probably already has enough of our money, but we give them a little bit more to like promote this. Now, this post for Rise Against Hunger has been the most popular post that we've ever probably done in Newbridge history. It also has garnered the most negative, awful, awful comments that you can imagine. I've had to check every day, multiple times a day, just to hide these awful comments. Comments like, stop having children. Or... Can't your, do, can't your God do something about that? This was an atheist from California. I'm like, what? You know, why don't you just, you know, keep, keep quiet over there. 
Or this one got me. This shook me a little bit. He never rose again. He's not coming back. Get over it. Okay, now, I, I calculated just based on the amount of comments. Now, some people will say, amen, praise God, this is great. My church did this last week. But about 75% of the comments were these terrible, awful comments. And it shook me up a little bit, but I didn't respond to them. I didn't say, you know, you better watch out. You know, I didn't, I didn't say anything. I just didn't even get, I, I just hid them, right? I literally, as a, as a, as a Facebook manager of the Facebook page, Newbridge page, I just said, hide, right? And that's the, uh, that's the electronic equivalent of, of me just, just walking away, right? I'm not going to get in the mud with these people. Because you know, at the end of the day, the atheist in California is going to realize when his knee is bended before a holy God that there is a God. And he has done something about the hungry people. He asked us here at Newbridge Church to take part in feeding them. And many other people were doing something about it. Don't give light to that, art, the, that, that nasty, nasty art. Yeah, it could shake you a little bit, but remember that God is faithful. And that when he's called you to do something good, opposition will rise, but he's got you in his hand. He's got you. Sam Ballad and Tobiah, we're going to hear more about them throughout the story. They make a lot of noise. But here's the thing, and you need to understand this. They couldn't really do anything about the, the rebuilding effort. Why? Because Nehemiah had asked for and gotten the protection of the king. Remember the army that he sent with him? The cavalry that he sent with Nehemiah? The letters of permission to the various governors in the area. These folks are making noise, but Nehemiah and the rest of the people who are, are, are building or rebuilding this wall, they were protected by the king. Now hear me now. Your opposition may become furious. Your enemy might raise his voice or try to intimidate you, but know this, hear me now. Your enemies cannot hinder or stop the progress of building in your life because God has you. He has, you have the protection of the king. You have the protection of the king of kings. You are under his protection and he will protect you. And Nehemiah doesn't engage them. But then what does he do immediately? In the face of this intense opposition, he prays a very bold prayer. This is not like a, a bedtime prayer. This is like a very bold prayer. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. He's saying, I'm not going to do, Nehemiah is saying, I'm not going to do this, but God, I need you. We need you to defend what you have called us to do here. When we pray first, instead of arguing with the uh, opposition, what we're doing is we're inviting the true defender of our very souls to the table, the God who has promised to defend us, the God who has promised them success because he's called them to this holy task. The point is pray now, not later. Pray now not later. I couldn't help think of this candy I used to buy at the corner store when I was a kid. They called it now and laters. That's all I can afford. It was like, you know, if I found five cents, I saved some pennies. I could go to the corner store, which was literally five doors down from my apartment in, in New York City, and I bought a now and later. Starbursts were like the luxurious candies. I, TD couldn't afford that. It was the now and laters. The whole point is pray now, and you can pray later too, but pray now. Pray now. That should be our first reaction. We don't engage the enemy. What we do is we engage the king of kings to engage the enemy. When I'm, when I'm counseling somebody or when I'm casting something out or declaring something in the heavenlies, I am not standing in my own authority. I am standing in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't cast out demons, but he can. And so I stand behind him. And this is what we do when we face this opposition. We stand not in our own strength, but in his. We pray now and later. And then we see Nehemiah sending defenses to the gaps in the wall. He mines the gap. 
Again, growing up in the city, you know, there's, there's one, a couple stations in particular. There's one Union, Square, Union Square on the four train. There's this enormous gap where when the train comes into the station, that this little platform has to come out. And you have to watch that because if, you, if it's not out, you're going, you're going on the tracks. And so you've got to mind the gap. And so what Nehemiah does is he, he, he assesses the situation of the wall and he sends people to those weak spots in the wall. He minds the gap. And friends, I want to ask you this morning, when you think about your life, when you look at your life, what are the weak areas of the walls of defenses in your life? If you're honest with yourself, uh, with yourself right now, how do you self-medicate? Or what are your key temptations? If you know what those are, then you're headed in the right direction. You know what your gaps are. You're in the right neighborhood. Are you tempted? Is it greed that you're tempted by? Is it am- amassing stuff? Is it lust? It's greed. Maybe you need to give some stuff away or increase your generosity. Or if you struggle with lust, maybe it's time to confess to somebody for the first time. Or maybe it's time to install some software on your computer or seek out an accountability partner. Whether it's greed or lust or envy or anger or pride, whatever it is, is, here's what I know to be true, is that everyone in this room and everyone listening to me on the live stream has a point of weakness. There is a place in each one of our lives where we need to mind the gap that we need to send defenses to those areas so that we can defend against a sudden attack. And this is what I want to finally point out is that Nehemiah and the rest of his motley crew, they don't just send defenses to those places, but they stick together. They stay together in their defense. The point here is that if you and I are isolated, if we are out of community, if we, uh, we live our lives in isolation, what, uh, what, what uh, step is this on the 12 step? I'll probably get a text later on today what, what step this is in the, uh, in the 12 step program. But if we live in isolation, then we are, we are defenseless. But if we live together, if we live in community, if we stick together, we can help defend against the attack of the evil one. Friends, I need you to understand this. In this day and age, in 2023, are we so individualized in our spirituality and Christianity in America that when we are under attack, we're so alone, we've we've made it so personal, we have a personal relationship with Jesus that we have isolated ourselves and we are vulnerable to attack. We need to stick together when the enemy attacks We need to help each other defend. And what are our weapons? Our weapon is the word of God. The word of God is the sword. It's the offensive weapon. We need to know the truth. We need to know who we are in Christ. I heard a preacher recently uh, talk about the movie, The Born Identity. You know, the, the movies that are based on the books the born identity. And here Jason Bourne, if you know the story, he's a he's a, a special agent who has had special training and something happens and at the opening of that book and in that movie we see Jason Bourne doesn't remember who he is. And then all of a sudden, as as the days go on, he realizes he can take out 10 people attacking him like with no problem. Like he can remember, uh, he can speak different languages. And as it progresses, we see Jason Bourne remember who he was or who he is. And friends, our defenses against the attack of the enemy, one of our strongest defenses is remembering who we are as daughters and son of the Most High King. We need to know who we are, and when we know who we are, we can activate the spirit of the living God against the enemy of our soul. Remember who you are. Remember who you are and stick together. Can we show Morris Township what it looks like to live in community? 
Can we come to each other's defenses when somebody's struggling? Can we, can we take the time to hear them, to be present with them, to lift them up in prayer? I need you to preach the gospel to me just like I preach the gospel to you. Can you encourage me? Can we do this together? They stuck together. They gave no voice to the enemy. They prayed bold prayers. They minded the gaps of their weaknesses in the wall's defense. And they stayed together. And the text says, when the trumpet sounds, when the alarm goes out, somebody's in trouble, will you gather together in that place of attack and encourage and strengthen and support Friends, I want you to know that if you ask me to pray for you, I pray for you right then and there. And if I send you an email or a text response, I'm not just like dismissing you. I pray for you. Will you do that for your brothers and sisters? Will we stay together? Will we be attentive to people who are struggling and have find, find themselves in, in major opposition? Will we stay together? I was excited to preach this message. Mm, mm, mm. God is good. God is calling us to great things. God is calling us to great things in this space right here. I love that each one of you are here, and I don't say that. I don't, I don't, that's not flippant. I'm serious. I love what God is doing here, and God has called us to build something special, and we've been doing it for almost 10 years now, and we're going to continue to do it, and we rest in the hope and the promise of God. We will face opposition. People can make comments on our Facebook page, but we're going to gather together here next Saturday in force together to feed hungry people. That's what we're doing. Because Jesus said, if you've not done it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you've not done it unto me. And so we gather and we move forward in Christ, in his power, in the hope of his resurrection, and in the good news of the gospel. Amen.